All right, so I'm Lauren Block. I work at Onyx Maps. I'm talking about GIS and specifically parallel computing. Um, how many people don't know what GIS is? A couple people. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll just quick, I'll just quickly um, define this for the, for people that are confused. So uh, GIS is a geographic information system. So it's essentially uh, an information system that has some type of geographic information in it. Um, so if you kind of break it down, what that means is there's spatial data and attribute data that's associated with the spatial data. So if you think about, um, if you had some data um, at your company about the number of support calls that you have from each state and you wanted to, to um, display that on a heat map, the spatial information would be the outline of the state and then the attribute information would be the number of support calls you have from that state. So um, the attribute data is always tied to the spatial data. So spatial data with no attribute data um, is meaningless. Like even in Google Maps, if there's a road, this, the attribute information is the name of the road. If there's just a line with nothing associated with it, um, it's not a GIS system. So how is GIS used? Um, visualization is a common use. Um, you know, people are used to using maps on their phones or maps on um, websites, so that's a pretty common use. Um, but you can also do processing and analysis behind the scenes using the spatial data and not have a visual component. So essentially it's just a data system where all the data is tied to spatial information. So um, I'll explain a little bit about how I got into GIS and my background, I knew nothing about GIS when I started working at Onyx Maps about two years ago. Um, so the, a lot of this is information that I've been learning um, quickly to kind of catch up. Um, so Onyx Maps, if people aren't familiar, we make a product called Onyx Hunt that started off as a chip for a Garmin GPS unit. Um, and what I mean by chip is an SD card that you insert into your Garmin GPS and then it will replace the default map on the Garmin with a map that we produce. Um, and now we've, we've moved into iPhone and Android and uh, we have a web application too. So our map focuses on hunting information for hunters. Um, so that means information that's specific to hunting like game management unit boundaries um, and designated walking areas. But um, we also focus on land ownership information, so that's public and private land. So hunters want to know um, that they're hunting on public land, and if they're on private land, they want to know who owns it. So if, they're, if they got permission from somebody, they're on the correct property that's actually owned by the person they got permission from. Um, and so the interesting thing about Onyx Maps is we serve all of our own map data. So we don't use another service. Um, a lot of companies, you know, if you think of like Uber, they kind of have a partnership with a mapping um, technology company that, that provides the map part. We serve our own maps um, and we do a lot of analysis and we even serve map data dynamically, which means we kind of produce one-off map data for users. So it's a pretty big GIS operation. Um, it's pretty complicated. Um, and so it, it, it's been a fun learning experience to kind of jump in and, and try to figure this out. Uh, and then I guess a little pitch for the app. Um, we have our mobile developers in the back, so I guess this is a shout out to them. But uh, we're a number one grossing navigation app, in iOS, and top five grossing Android sports app. I don't know why we're in different categories. I think they didn't have a navigation category in, in Android. Yeah. So, so here's my thesis statement. So after spending the last couple years working with GIS software, um, I've, I've begun to feel that a lot of the software industry is based on software that's inefficient and not scalable. Um, so we're dealing with a lot of low-level problems that other industries have kind of solved. Um, and for some reason, the GIS world hasn't solved these problems. Esri. <laughs> so, yeah, Esri. So um, it, it's interesting to me, you know, trying to figure out why the GIS industry feels like it's behind the rest of the software world. Um, and I don't really know the answer, but I have a couple ideas, so I just kind of compiled a, a, you know, a couple examples of, of the problems that we've faced and maybe a couple ideas of why um, the GIS world is where it's at. Um, 
So I'll give a background of GIS software, um, then an overview of the tools, and then I have a couple examples of kind of parallel algorithms problems that we've had to solve that feel a little bit more low level than you probably have to dig into in other industries. So first off, um, as I was reaching researching the history of GIS, I found a couple of interesting maps. It's kind of unrelated to my talk, but I thought this was interesting. So this is the first heat map ever created. It was created in 1832. Uh, so it's um, cholera in Paris. It's kind of interesting to see um, how kind of the hand lettering and uh, the um, handmade map um, so this is, this is the first instance of somebody overlaying data on top of an existing map. Um, and the person I created is named John Snell, so that's a pretty good name. Um, <laughs> so if you look at this, he has the streets here, and he, he adds these little kind of black bars for, for how much outbreak is in an area. So it's kind of like these little bar charts sticking out of the, the streets, pretty interesting. So this is. Some people consider this the first example of a real GIS system because it's taking the spatial information and attaching data on top of it. So skipping ahead to the computer world, um, the first GIS software was created at Harvard um, Graduate School of Design in 1969. It's called SciMap. I thought this was interesting. This is the printout of SciMap maps. Um, it uses kind of these little characters to create the maps. It's pretty interesting. It kind of looks like ASCII art. Um, so I thought that was kind of interesting. It seems like in some ways it would be more difficult to design a system like this than to use kind of modern graphics to create maps. So um, at Harvard in 1969, um, Esri was founded by um, someone named Jack Dangermond, which is, that's not a good epic name. <laughs> um, so Esri stands for the Environmental Systems Research Institute. He founded it with his wife, um, and then later in 1981, they released the first commercial GIS product. The interesting thing here is Esri has essentially had a monopoly on GIS software from this point until now. So it's kind of incredible in the software world to have someone who can, you know, the, the first company to create a commercial product has essentially maintains a monopoly um, for 40 years. So um, originally the ARC info was just kind of a background command line um, system. So in 1991 they created a Windows program that was called ArcView GIS, which allowed you to kind of visualize the spatial information. Um, and then later in 1999 they created ArcMap, which combined the visual um, Windows program with the back end power of their original product. And this ArcMap, product is essentially universal in GIS. Um, you learn this in school. If you're studying GIS, most places in the world um, use ArcMap. So one th thing that is interesting about ArcMap is I feel like usually in the software world, um, the software has an intended purpose that's, that's more geared towards end users or developers. So something like QuickBooks you know, it's not a powerhouse underneath, but it's more of like the user interface and the kind of system that draws in the end user. Um, and then there's kind of developer-based technology, like if a developer needed to analyze terabytes of information, they might use something like Hadoop and MapReduce. The interesting thing about the GIS world is ArcMap um, appeals to people with the graphic interface and the framework but you might also, as a GIS person, want to analyze terabytes of information. So it, it has to kind of cross um, both um, boundaries. So I think that gives a little bit of insight as to why the software is not competitive, because it has to um, be user-friendly and powerful, and so there's compromises that happen there. Um, so, so that's Esri. Open source software, um, you know, if you want to if you don't want to pay entry for software, you can use open source. The open source world is pretty interesting. I, I think the same year that Esri came out, there was an open source project that I think was created by the um, Corps of Engineers, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, called GRASS GIS, which I don't think is widely used anymore. Um, 
So e even in the early days, people were trying to kind of figure out an open source um, version of this that people can use. Um, but it was really um, Ogre and GDAL that kind of stuck and became the standard in the open source community. Um, GDAL stands for Geospatial Data Abstraction Library, and Ogre doesn't stand for anything, apparently. It was, it was a vestige of an early um, project title that ended up um, sticking around, so it's just Ogre. Um, one of the engineers at Onyx wanted me to show in this presentation the website for GDAL to show how dated <laughs> the website looks nowadays. It's like GeoCities with like <laughs> Comic Sans font and like random pictures of planets. Um, <laughs> so um, GDAL and Ogre are the core of almost all the open source software even today. So the industry kind of um, developed a foundation back in 1998, and that's kind of been the foundation ever since. Um, and the difference between Ogre and GDAL is GDAL handles the raster um, spatial data, and Ogre handles the vector data. So another big, um, a, another important thing in the open source community is PostGIS, which is the spatial objects for Postgres. Um, so that was developed um, I, I met the, the guy that developed that at a conference and he said the way it was created was um, he went to one of his developers at his, at his consulting company and said, wouldn't it be cool if uh, Postgres had a spatial type? And the developer was like, okay, hold my beer. <laughs> 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 and that, so that was Postgres was created. <laughs> and today, this, this, it's kind of the standard now for if you, if you need your spatial data in a relational database. Um, MySQL and Oracle have also added spatial types um, that aren't as um, fleshed out, but kind of post is the standard for, for open source databases. Um, the Geos project is pretty interesting. That happened around the, the same time as post -Gist. It was created by a GIS analyst in Canada working for the Ministry of Forest. Um, he was just frustrated with Esri and just thought he would start a project to, to create an open source tool that did a lot of the um, more complicated spatial analysis. So Ogre and GDAL kind of handled the basic um, operations, and he needed something that did, ev basically he wanted something that did everything Esri does. Um, he has an interesting blog post where he talks about a friend that he had that worked at Esri who had signed a non-disclosure, who couldn't give him information on how the algorithms were implemented, but would give him hints as to how difficult things were. So if he thought something was easy, his friend would be like, eh, I'm gonna look at that one a little bit more. <laughs> and so he used that to kind of develop the system. Um, so an interesting thing is he, he started developing this in Java, and there's still a Java version that, that's kind of around on the internet that's not maintained. But he converted to C in order to um, hook Geos into PostGIS, because um, Postgres is all written in C. So at this point, Post just underneath uses geos. So really everything in the open source community kind of funnels down into the same core code. Um, Quantum GIS came out around the same time and it's the graphic interface, like an open source graphic interface to kind of compete with Esri's um, um, UI tool. And underneath it uses Ogre and geos. So, you know, it, this is the core of essentially all of the open source code. So one thing that we've been noticing with looking at, at libraries is you kind of see the same names pop up. <laughs> so there's really a core group of guys that are kind of maintaining and writing all of the code. Um, if you find a good library by one developer, you're probably going to find a couple other libraries by the same guy. You start knowing them by name, like, oh, Sean Gillies, he's pretty good. He, he writes good stuff. So it's a pretty small group of people that are writing a lot of these libraries. And everything is built on the same core code. So if you get a GIS library for Ruby, underneath it's probably just hooking into the C code that, that's Ogre and GDAL and Geos. If you get a Go library, it's probably the same way. Python library, pretty much all of it just hooks into the same code. And underneath runs the same algorithms. Um, you know, when you think about maps, a lot of people think about Google Maps and a lot of these other companies, like Apple has a lot of map stuff figured out. They, you know, aren't sharing their secrets, so whatever they have going on there kind of hasn't um, bled into the, the rest of the community. Um, and 
the, the open source community only needs to compete with Esri, so they, a lot of times stuff gets widely used even if it doesn't scale well because it scales as well as Esri does. Um, and a lot of projects, um, you know, schools, governments, um, kind of small research places have projects that have few users, so stuff will get widely adopted in government stuff where you know a city wants to have a map that shows their hiking trails, but they only expect a couple dozen people maybe to be on there at the same time. So the, the fact that it, the software doesn't scale out to a bunch of users doesn't mean it won't be widely adopted in the industry. So it's kind of a, just because something is widely used doesn't necessarily mean it'll scale out to like a Google Maps um, infrastructure. So there's a couple of companies in the open source community that are um, trying to compete with Esri. They're mostly competing kind of on the back end of things. So if, if you think of that analogy with Esri being both QuickBooks and Hadoop, um, a lot of these guys are more trying to just focus on that back end to, for developers side. Like um, Mapbox is, makes a lot of open source software. And I think Mapbox is um, what powers Uber, the maps on Uber and a lot of other products. So um, uh, these companies are contributing. There's not very many here. And one interesting thing is MapZen, which was a pretty big um, open source contributor, is gone. They uh, went under a couple months ago. So it seems like the world is getting smaller for these open source uh, mapping companies that are contributing code. So I, I thought I'd run through this example that one of our engineers at Onyx ran into. Um, so this is an example of the type of thing you're going to run into when you're using the open source tools that call into that core code that may or may not have been optimized that was written by a GIS analyst in Canada that was frustrated. Um, so I'll, I'll explain this problem then I'll go over a couple um, solutions that are optimal and then I'll show you what they actually do. So the problem here is we have a multi-polygon object and what that means is you have one row in your data set that um, has multiple polygons associated with it. So if you think about a database of states, Hawaii is eight different islands. So that means there's eight different polygons that all represent Hawaii. So a common thing in GIS is, is running a validation on your geometry and that means verifying that the polygons or lines are actually valid. So one thing you might check for is the negative space, like if the polygon cuts into itself, um, that's invalid geometry. With a polygon, you might check for if the polygon only has two points instead of three points, then it, it has no area and it's not a valid polygon. Um, so one check that you do during validation with a multi-polygon is you verify that none of the polygons are overlapping. So it's impossible for the islands of Hawaii to be on top of each other. If, if they are in your data, your data is wrong. So that's a uh, validation step. So um, oh, apparently you need to optimize for PC. <laughs> so here's a, here's a trivia question. There's eight islands in Hawaii. Does anyone know how many islands are in Alaska? 800. You're, you're close. <laughs> All right, OK, we're going to 800. <laughs> There's uh, 2,670. And these are, these are the named islands. There's actually a bunch of unnamed islands that can be in the geometry too. So there's actually more than 10,000 tiny island pieces that could be in the, in the geometry for, for Alaska. So you can see how an inefficient algorithm here, if you're thinking about the naive approach here of running an algorithm to check every single polygon against every single other polygon, when you have 10,000 islands in Alaska, you get 100 million checks. Um, to, ver to, to make sure every polygon is checked with every other polygon. So um, that gets pretty unreasonable quickly. And the interesting thing is that the a database that has the state outlines might not be very big. So you have 50 states, uh, maybe it's only a couple hundred megabytes, um, but you try to run this validation, all of a sudden, um, if you do it in the naive approach, it's going to take forever, right? Because it's going to do 100 million polygon conversions. 
So you can think about it for a minute and try to think about what a more efficient approach would be and how you might use the, all the processors on your machine and an efficient algorithm to calculate this. Um, so I, I'll run through a couple kind of scenarios that, that you might use. So it turns out that it's fairly inexpensive to calculate the bounding box for a polygon. So given that, one thing you can do is create a bounding box for every polygon and then remove any where the bounding boxes don't overlap because that's a much simpler check. So in this case, none of these polygons overlap, but you see there's these little clusters here where some of the bounding boxes overlap. So you'd essentially remove everything that's not, that, that doesn't have an overlapping bounding box and then just check those. So that reduces your, your set. And if you're, if you're passing all of these polygons off to multiple processors, you know, you can sort of limp along and, and get something that's okay. You know, you remove the, the ones where the, the bounding box doesn't touch and then just kind of round robin the, the polygons off to the different processors. And then, and then um, when a polygon shows up at a processor, it compares it to the full set, and then, and then you do it that way. So that's OK. Um, you're going to get some efficiency gain there. Um, probably not great. So decomposing by spatial area is, is another um, approach. This one's probably a little bit better for most scenarios. So the idea is you break this into pieces. So if you have four processors here, um, you can break this into four pieces. So the idea is if a polygon is firmly in one quadrant, it's impossible that it could be overlapping with the polygon in another quadrant. So you only pass off all of the polygons that are inside or touching the line of a quadrant off to a, a processor, and it only compares against itself. So that this reduces the amount of computation greatly because you're you're decomposing into little pieces. Because if you think about the comparing everything to everything, it's it's in the computer science world an n squared big O n squared algorithm. So if you're reducing n into little small pieces, these n squared algorithms get a little bit faster. Um, so this one works pretty well. The problem is if you decompose too much, you get a lot of overlap. So so this quadrant has to take all the polygons that touch the quadrant. And the quadrants next to it have to take all the polygons that touch there. So you get a lot of duplication if you're decomposing too much. So you can actually decompose too much and then have too much overlap, and then you're recomputing the same things over and over again. So it, it kind of breaks down into a certain efficiency size you can get, and then it becomes more inefficient as you, as you break it down more. The other problem here is you have to be able to divide up the area spatially in a way that makes sense. Because if you do it in a way that doesn't make sense and you just get all of your polygons up in one piece, you, you're just back at the same problem over again. So you kind of have to do analysis to, to make sure that you're able to break it apart in a way that evenly distributes the polygons. So there's a bit of pre-computing that can make this complicated. So the line scan solution is, is one of the most efficient. So in computer science terms, this one's only big square n. So it only has to go through every polygon once, which is a huge improvement. Um, so the idea is you start with these scan lines, and they scan along, and they keep track of when they touch the lines of the polygons, and they can detect overlap as they scan along. So you could give a scan line to each one of your processors. They can go along, so it's a big N, a big O N algorithm that's parallelized, so that should be pretty fast. Um, the, the, you have a similar problem with making sure that your scan lines are in the correct spot, so you can essentially get no value from the, your parallel algorithm if your scan, if one scan line and kind of scan the whole thing. Um, so if you were today to load up a GIS library and do a multi-polygon validation using any of the libraries that call into GEOS, which is pretty much every single one, um, what would you expect their algorithm to be? Probably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It just does that on one processor. <laughs> so doing this check for Alaska makes one thread do 100 million computations. So you can understand how, given different data sets and different um, scenarios, using the open source tools um, can be super inefficient. So this is an example of a problem where if you wanted an efficient way to do this, you have to write it yourself, essentially. Or um, 
You might even have to write something that's specific to the type of data sets you're using that's optimized to that. Um, and to me, that this feels like a lot lower level than you probably expect in other industries where people are kind of used to just passing stuff off to libraries and like, okay, you do your efficient calculation and I don't have to worry about the details. Um, uh, so I'm gonna go through some of the tools widely used in GIS and explain some of the problems that, we, that we've had in other areas where it seems like they're not very optimized. Um, so ArcPy is a version of Python that's used in Esri to automate actions in the UI. So if you're working at an assessor's office and you're doing a lot of the same operations, you might write a little Python script that kind of like, you know, clicks the things in the UI for you essentially. Um, so a lot of a lot of the GIS experts that use Esri will learn Python because it's built into Esri. So it's kind of the starting point for most GIS people to kind of get into a, a deeper level um, software approach. Uh, it, but ArcPy has some problems. It has pa package management problems. You know, you kind of have to make, make sure you're on the right version of everything because it's running inside of Esri. So if you have a Python environment that's outside and you're using a package manager, um, you can have some problems there. It doesn't have built-in multiprocessor support, so if you write a Python script that's complicated and doing all this stuff, it's going to run on one thread unless you know how to make it run on all your processors. Um, and then QGIS has a similar kind of Python automation um, built-in, but it has a lot of the same problems. So I think a lot of like frustrated GIS users will kind of start here and figure out some automation they can do and then feel like, okay, I, I need to find something that, that's faster and working better for me. So that's, I, I think that's a part of the reason that Python has become so widely used in the GIS world. Um, the, the GIS experts that are using Esri kind of dip their toes into Python and um, then want to move from that into full-blown Python. And Python's a very simple language to learn, so it, it um, it works well for an industry where a lot of the, the GIS experts are not computer scientists and didn't go to school and learn lots of different um, computer languages. So it's very accessible and a lot of the um, GIS software is written in Python, but it's, the performance is terrible in Python. So um, there's the global interpreter lock, which basically makes it almost impossible to use multi-processor stuff unless you really know what you're doing. So out of the box, you're basically running everything on a single thread. Um, all the Python libraries that hook into the Ogre and GDAL and Geo stuff use something called SWIG, which I think is a standard um, something interface generator, which creates wrappers around C to be used in other languages. Um, oh, wrap, standard wrapper and interface generator. Um, and Python tends to not work well. Even if you can get your code to work in mul multiple um, processes, you can't move an object that's, that's hooked into your C code to another processor. So even if you know what you're doing, you get stopped as soon as you're trying to use any of these built-in GIS libraries. And just general poor performance, like even, even if you weren't dealing with this stuff and you could access all the other processors easily, Python just doesn't. And one thing we've noticed is almost all the libraries are written by the head of open source software at Mapbox. So there's basically one guy that is like, if you, if you want to get out of ArcPy, you basically go to this one guy's world of, of GIS libraries. Is Mapbox the one that just shut down? No, that was MapZen. MapZen was, so Mapbox is still going strong. Okay. They actually got a bunch of VC money, so they, I think they're, they're going to be around for a while. MapZen was... You, you could look up maps then, but it was interesting. They they were um, they didn't want to make money, <laughs> and then they went under. <laughs> Sounds like that. Yeah, it was, like, it was a very kind of hippie, like they were just trying to make the world a better place, and then, then they went under. <laughs> so another technology that we've used that's that's widely used in the in the GIS world and GIS software is SQLite. Um, so that's just a file based database. Um, so this is used for a bunch of different stuff. There's Spatialite, which is kind of a file-based version of PostGIS. There's the R-Tree, which is a spatially indexed file-based uh, database. 
uh, MB tiles, which is a thing that holds like um, these map tiles that are cut out for like pre-rendered map tiles. And GeoPackage is another popular one. So the, um, SQLite is fairly simple to use, so it's kind of been embraced by the GS world because it's, um, it, it's easy to use and understand. If you go to the SQLite website under their frequently asked questions, if you, if you go down to the question that says, can I use uh, multiple processes, it just says threads are evil. <laughs> so, um, okay. and one thing we've noticed is we would expect that it to be at least easy to, to do read-only operations out of a SQLite using threads just because um, there's no chance for conflict if you're not writing any information, but a lot of the libraries still won't let you do that just because they know to be extra careful about threading stuff. So depending on the library, it might block you out from even doing read-only stuff multi-threaded. So what it means is if you have to initialize a bunch of database stuff to get into your file-based database, you might have to do it on every single thread that you want to have access to this thing, which is not very efficient. Um, and also, a lot of the libraries are not geared towards these GIS uses. So they, you know, somebody comes up with a cool um, format for holding stuff in a SQLite database, but they don't really put the tooling around it, so you kind of have to build your own tooling, and they might not have thought through the efficiencies of it. So it can be a frustrating experience. So one thing you can do is you can, if you're having problems with efficiency, go and work on the core underlying um, libraries that are kind of running everything that's written in C and C++. Um, C is not very user friendly. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that can be a frustrating experience and I think a lot of companies would, would probably not trust their average developer to write a patch to an underlying C library and put that in production. So that, that has its own downsides. Um, some other languages that are widely used or um, becoming more used in the GIS world, um, R. I, I'm not very familiar with R, but it's gaining a lot of traction in GIS because it fixes some of the problems with the open source stuff because it's kind of, it's a spatial analysis language and a lot of the GIS tools are kind of been built from scratch recently and solve a lot of these problems. So it's, I, it seems like a huge trend in GIS to kind of get off the old stuff and move on to R. I don't know enough about it to, to be able to comment too much on it, but it, it's, you, you see it com, coming up a lot in the literature. Um, Java has some stuff that's written in Java, so you don't have to deal with the underlying um, libraries. It's probably, of all the languages, the one that has the most, that I found that has the most like actual underlying Java code that's running a lot of the, the GIS software. So it could be an option if you need, if you feel like you need to get off of the um, the Geos um, GDAL stack. For some reason, Mapbox is really keen on writing stuff um, in JavaScript, kind of recreating the the geometry operations in JavaScript. I think it's because they do a lot of mobile stuff and web stuff, and it you can use it on client and server, um, but. It's going to have the same inefficiency problems that a lot of other languages have. It's writing, writing JavaScript is user friendly, but on the back end, it's going to be slow. So I, I'm not sure why they're rewriting a lot of the stuff in something that's going to also be slow. Because um, it runs on the client. Yeah, because it runs on the client. That's, that's yeah. <laughs> um, So Esri makes exclusively Windows software. So Esri is a Windows thing. They don't do Mac. So they've started um, using some C sharp, um, you know, Microsoft C sharp stuff, to kind of move away from the ArcPy. So there, there's more C sharp stuff going into Esri software. I think that would probably mean the GIS people will have some experience with C sharp, which means um, there probably will be more tooling around C sharp in the future that will, will come up. So I thought I'd run through a quick example of the type of problem we might um, be solving at using these uh, JS libraries. So one thing that happens a lot is when you're using this stuff, you end up in these situations where you have these long running tasks. You, you can do something parallelizable, then you get into a SQLite, and it's not parallelizable. So then you, you can do another thing that's parallelizable, then you get into some Python library that's not. So we kind of get these long running tasks where it's like in and out of, of code we can optimize and code we can't. So you get these things that are like, 
variable length, and there's these pieces of parallelizable, not parallelizable code. So kind of the naive thing would be not even worry about it, just pass the whole task off to each thread and just let them run as single threaded operations, which this is efficient, pretty efficient if you just have a constant stream of tasks coming in and you're constantly processing stuff, just kind of do the naive thing and, and pass these around. Um, problem is if you have a service that needs to return quickly, but you may or may not be running tasks through it all the time. So it might be something that sits there and you're only running maybe one or two at a time on average of these tasks. So what ends up happening is you only have one thread that has to sit there and grind through the entire task by itself while the rest of the machine is not doing anything. So in this situation, we're having long running tasks where they're, they're coming in and getting run one at a time. We want to be able to use the whole machine to kind of push these through. So um, one thing we've done is basically have one thread that handles a single threaded stuff, and then when he gets to a part that he can, he can parallelize, he asks his friends to help out, and then you get the, the um, computation spread across all the threads. So that, that's fine, and it, what it means is when, that, when we're working on that single job, he's going to get it done faster, because he, he can utilize the other processors. The, the problem with that is if you get this potentially extremely long-running task, um, the, the naive approach could be better because if you have this extremely long running thread and then other jobs are, are coming in, the thread that has the extremely long running task can just sit there and work on that while the other threads are free to accept work. So they'll be able to push stuff through. So, you know, if you, if you have one thread that's handling the single threaded stuff, he's, he basically gets blocked on the extremely long running task and everything can get back up here. So what we end up doing is a lot of like, just try to optimize thread stuff, like you know, maybe you have a couple threads doing single threaded stuff and then you have your helper tool that handles the, the multiple processor stuff and then if you tune this right and kind of get the ratios right, it should even out. Um, and you can kind of push stuff through quickly and then also be able to utilize the, the multiple thread stuff. So, it's definitely been an experience, you know, I, I wasn't doing a lot of intense parallel code. I took a class in grad school, that was pretty much my experience, so it's been fun to like spend a lot of time with threads and tuning stuff and trying to write these optimized algorithms to, to utilize all the, the computation power on the chain. So I guess just some final thoughts, um, you know, I think the mapping world is pretty interesting and um, it's pretty fun to work in. It feels pretty small, just because you keep running into the same people, and it seems like there's only a handful of people writing all the software, a handful of companies. Um, and I, you know, one, I guess one of the fun things or difficult things is that you end up writing a lot of low-level code that you probably wouldn't end up doing in a lot of other 